So Petra is going to talk us about flexible querying on graph data. So thank you very much. Right, so just as an introduction to summarize what I'm going to be speaking about, it's essentially my PhD topic which involves a declarative query language allowing for the flexible querying of graph structured data with complex parts. Essentially, um, uh, thinking about what Peter was talking about earlier is pattern matching. Right, so just a very quick agenda. I'm going to have to talk about quite a lot in 15 minutes, so I'm going to Last rush one. through <laughs> these things here. Um, who I am, why, uh, some background information to help you understand what it's all about, a few ex illustrative examples, how it's done, and then that's pretty much it. So uh, that's me. This is probably the most uh, least interesting slide, and I've actually got a double life, as you can see. So um, essentially, why? What, what, what's, what's the motivation for this? And essentially, the reason is, is that the structure of graph, uh, graph structure data is becoming more and more prevalent. It's being used in more and more use cases. And the problem is, is that it's becoming more and more complex all the time, and especially with respect to the paths. So essentially, paths can also change all the time. So one day, you might have two things joined by three paths called X, Y, Z. The next day, it may be joined by X, Y, Z, A, say, for example. So um, essentially, we want to avoid the um, image down below, which is where we have data that's essentially very, very useful potentially for people. But uh, if the query language does not actually allow people to extract interesting information from it, it's basically useless. And this makes people very, very annoyed, as I'm sure you can imagine. So um, essentially the idea was to allow users to also perhaps explore the data and also maybe to derive some intelligence from it. Just a quick background on ontologies. And uh, essentially, this is part of the semantic web stack, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. And a, what, a very brief summary about it is models of domain of interest. It, it includes inferencing and reasoning, which is very, very interesting, especially for intelligent applications. And um, I'm actually including some of this in my graph query language, but I'll be focusing on the subclass uh, construct, which is essentially, here I'm giving you an example. For example, history and languages can be subclasses of humanities as a superclass. So, okay, right, so what is it? It's uh, generally, I'm using a very, very, very general uh, graph data model. So V is a bunch of vertices all labeled with a constant, and E is a set of directed labeled edges where the labels are drawn from some alphabet and also the type edge, which I'll come to in a moment. It's called Flexit, not the most um, exciting name. And the basis is that of conjunctive regular path queries. I'm gonna explain what that's about in the next slide. And there are also two operators which I use. So this is just a bit of a background explanation of what conjunctive regular path queries are. And this is where the paths are actually expressed by regular expressions. So things like Sparkle, Gremlin, uh, Neo4j, Cypher, they already use some form of this to actually express the pattern which you want to match. And essentially this is what this, essentially the semantics looks like, is X, R, Y, X and Y either being constants or variables, and R being the regular expression expressing the path between X and Y. Uh, the conjunctive part just comes from joining up, so we're basically performing an AND. So, uh, for example, in the uh, example I've given here, we actually match the X's with the X's and the Y's with the Y's. So, um, a little uh, pictorial example down here is essentially, imagine we have a node labeled with N1. The path to be traversed is one or more N's. What will Y be? So, I've actually prefixed all variables with a question mark. And Y in this case would actually evaluate N2 and N3 because we allow one or more Ns to be matched. Uh, in example number two, we have zero more Ns, but we absolutely insist on a P, so therefore the only potential match for Y will be N4. Right, so uh, back to now the two operators about which I mentioned a few slides back. So the approximation allows for the approximate matching of labels in the path, and um, essentially what I'm doing is applying an edit operation to each label in the path denoted by the regular expression. And I'm allowing insertions of extra edges. I'm allowing edges to actually be deleted. I'm allowing inversions of edges. What this means is if you've got a node X and a node Y, where we've got a label A from X to Y, I'm also allowing a reverse label from Y back to X. Uh, substitutions, where we actually allow one label to be substituted by another and also transpositions. So if you've got two label edges, we actually just swap the um, labels around. And I denote a cost to this. It's usually one, but it can actually be set to anything. And just here's a, a, an example to illustrate this. Um, essentially, R is expressed by zero more A's, followed by B. Any answers matching this will be returned as an exact match. However, imagine we insert a label P in front of A star B. 
answers matching this particular map pattern will be returned at cost 1. And imagine then we actually invert B and add that. We uh, return answers at cost 2, with the answers that match that particular expression. And uh, operation number two is relaxation, and this is where we use an ontology if one exists. I'm aware that ontologies are usually thought of in um, terms of being applied to RDF data, but there's actually nothing in ontology that says it's only used for RDF. It can be used for any graph model structure. And actually, it's a jolly useful thing, so yeah, I suggest you look at it if, if you haven't uh, examined it much before. And essentially what we're doing here is actually applying logical relaxation and inferencing of query conditions using an ontology that's associated with a graph. And um, I'm using four um, operations there, but I'll just cover the subclass one because that's quite a nice, easy one. It's something we're all familiar with. And again, there's usually a cost of one. And imagine we have an ontology. So coming back to our examples, we've got humanities as our superclass. So imagine this is you're at university and you're studying something humanities. That's all the arts kind of subjects. Languages and history could be subclasses of humanities. So imagine our query states that I'm happy to relax languages. So anything which matches languages immediately gets returned at cost zero, so that's an exact match. And um, anything belonging to history will actually be returned at cost one, because it's been relaxed to humanities, which suddenly grabs history, languages, art, drama, whatever else may be a subclass of uh, humanities. And uh, just some, uh, briefly to end this particular section is answers are actually ranked to how closely they match the original query. So obviously all your exact answers are bunched together, returned to you first. And then incrementally, you can actually return answers at distance one, distance two, distance three, etc. Of course, I mean, we want to return everything because eventually if you've got a, the right type of graph, you can actually end up with everything on your screen, which um, I don't think would be very, very useful at all. Right, so, um, okay, this is quite a busy looking graph, but actually it uh, does illustrate quite nicely uh, what's going on. And this is the example I'll be using. So... Uh, I do repeat this uh, diagram at, in further slides and I'll explain more, but essentially this was actually taken from a, a further learning um, domain and what we actually have here is a bunch of episodes, episodes either being where you're actually studying something or where you actually worked at something, so studying versus actually working. And you can see that episode 21, for example, was one of these studying type episodes, whereas episodes 22 through to 24 actually were career sort of um, episodes and they actually are separated by our labels meaning next which is either that it followed it in time or and, and prereq would actually indicate that in this instance episode 23 was absolutely mandatory it was a prerequisite for episode 24 to have occurred so in this case being a journalist having a job j23 being a journalist had to be performed before you could actually get the position of assistant editor right and then we've actually got the square boxes actually indicate the parts of the ontology. Actually, there's a bit of an error. BA English ought to actually be part of the real graph, not part of the ontology, so apologies for that. All right. So, uh, just focusing on the uh, section that I've denoted here. This is where the approximation will occur. Right, so we've actually got a bit of an example. So here's um, uh, the graph uh, diagram with a, a bit abbreviated. I must just point out that the qualif.typed English studies is actually just an abbreviation of episode 21. I've just skipped out the BA English node. I've gone straight to qualif.typed English studies just to make that image a bit smaller. Right, so a query that somebody could potentially pose is, right, I've studied, I've got a degree in English. Uh, what have other students that have studied the same degree I have gone on to actually... Uh, work in, you know, so sort of a bit of an inspirational thing maybe. So essentially in here I'm sort of wanting to return the episode and the actual job title. <coughs> so I'm um, actually what this would then equate to, obviously there would be a user front end to actually allow users to do this because I've never come across a user that can actually type stuff out like this. That would be great if they did, but that doesn't happen. Right, so essentially we've got five conjuncts there and the one in blue is the one I want you to take the most note of. What we actually have is that the first two conjuncts evaluate to and return episode 21. So I've highlighted it in blue. And then actually we've got a bit of a problem. Nothing more can actually be gleaned from this particular graph because um, there is no prereq label going from edge 21 to anywhere else in the graph. And it's a bit of a pity because actually there's some good stuff in this graph which would be relevant to the user. So um, yeah, so that's uh, not great. So if we actually allow approximation of that particular conjunct, we can now start getting some good stuff coming back. 
So prereq plus, i.e. one or more prereq labels, can now be, one of those prereq labels can now be substituted by next. So we end up with the um, expression next and then zero more prereqs. And now we suddenly start moving in the graph. And actually what's quite cool, episode 22 happily matches Y type work and Y job Z, which means therefore we actually get a result coming back at distance one of episode 22 air travel assistant. So How we start. Do you know that we <coughs> replace the prereq thing with next and not something else? It would basically be saying that the um, users could configure that. So they could actually say, I only want to allow replacement of edge labels. So everything, uh, so in, in Sigma, in the actual label set for this graph, it's, uh, it only consists of next and prereq as well as type. But you could actually define, <coughs> I only want to allow uh, replacements, but not deletions, for example. So this is just, um, obviously insertions could work as well, but in this particular instance, we decided replacements would be all we'd actually validly allow to be defined. So, um, cool, so we're now moving, we're back in business. And actually, traveling on from there, yeah, maybe, you know, this person's afraid of flying, so air travel assistance, not all that, um, well, not, not something they'd want to do, perhaps. We can actually now carry on approximating. Next, next, prereq, again, taking one of the prereqs from the zero or more. Of course, we've got, yeah, theoretically, infinitely many to play with. We now actually get the last two, journalist and assistant editor, being returned at distance two. And then the idea is, essentially, the user would see, oh cool, journalist, assistant, editor, let me see more about this user, and then they actually click on the episode and see the whole timeline in some <coughs> visualization tool. But that wasn't actually the focus of this particular exercise. So that's the approximation operation. So now I want to focus your attention on the ontology part. And this is actually anything where we actually have a node which has a type label going to something. And in fact, uh, the top part of this diagram here it describes SC stands for subclass, obviously. So English is a subclass of languages. Languages and history are subclasses of humanities. This is why I had that example earlier on. And we've got other things going on there as well. And um, yeah, and then we've obviously got uh, types university work and you can use that taxonomy. Right, so now we've got another different timeline just to make things a bit more interesting. So the question here is, what jobs are open to me if I study <coughs> English or something similar at university? So um, here it's like, so now we're actually applying relaxation to the um, variable type English studies conjunct, that second one over there. So we're not too bothered. English or something similar. That means uh, either definitely English, but maybe, you know, history or yeah, drama or literature, whatever the case may be. So you'd, you'd still be getting those um, results coming back from user two, which we had in the previous slides, if you may remember. But we'd now also be getting uh, things coming back from this particular user, user three. So... Um, Prereq can be approximated, so I won't go through that again because that's a bit of a repetition. But also now we have English studies can be relaxed via languages to humanities, which is distance two. So we're going up. So if I just go back, English studies relaxed to languages, relaxed to humanities, and suddenly now it will grab history and languages. So that's a distance two, and therefore um, we then add the approximation distance, which was one, if you remember, plus two being returned at three. So we'd actually be having no results at uh, user one, uh, at, sorry, at distance one. We'd be getting the air travel assistant at distance one. We'd be getting the journalist and assistant editor at distance two. And now we'd be getting personal assistant being returned at distance three. Because we've applied these two things in tandem. And then we'd actually carry on uh, going down through this graph now because the approximation would also carry on working. And now we actually get results, author and associate editor being returned at distance four, because now the approximation part actually is uh, the distance two part. So we suddenly get loads and loads of results just trickling through all the time. Uh, how is this done? So this is the only theory slide, I promise, that uh, essentially regular expressions in FAs are pretty much married to each other. Um, and so basically I took an NFA and I added some augmentations and new states and transitions are added to actually reflect the um, all the editor operations as well as the inferencing from the ontology. And essentially I take this automaton and I join it with a product graph G, uh, with G and we get a product automaton and that's actually then uh, traversed. A uh, bit of a typo in there, it's not shortest path traversal, it's least cost path traversal. Uh, quite a good time complexity and I'm actually currently proving the correctness of the algorithms and that's actually the focus at this point in time is that it sounds great, but if the algorithm's not correct, then we're kind of pretty much in a bit of trouble.
So, uh, yeah. Uh, but more practical stuff I've used. Sorry? Right. Uh, the graph database I used was DEX and a programming language C Sharp. No, simply because at work at the time I was using C Sharp a lot, so it was good to stay in that mind space and not kind of uh, get back to Java, which I used to do. Uh, further work is I'm actually, this is the part I'm working on, is a new operation which actually combines these two in tandem, which has turned out to be quite a bit of a beast. And um, of course, the other uh, present point everyone I think knows about is optimization. So lots of optimization to do. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. So if you guys have questions, we have five minutes for, for this. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much for your talk. Those thank you. Quite cool features you have for a query language. Uh, this is a nice anecdote of uh, when Larry Page said he wanted instant search for uh, Google, that the engineers bought because of the extra resource consumption that would cause. I guess this is a similar feature. It's really nice to have for users, but probably the resource usage increases. Uh, do you have any information about how many times more resources you use when a query is flexed? Sort of? uh, it's not too bad. Uh, the, the actual problem part is the actual new flexible operation, and that actually is quite awful because I actually need to prove that the things don't just carry on iterating to infinity. It's um, most of the work is actually done because of the because I'm using the automaton. Most of the work is actually done there for just the normal matching. So the approximation is doesn't add too much on it. However, one of the things I do want to investigate is to see whether it would be possible not to apply all five edit operations, because especially the deletion one, that's actually a bit of a pain in the neck, to actually minimize the number of transitions. So the less um, edit operations I use, the less transitions there are, would be better. So I'm going to try and establish some equivalences in maybe trying to eliminate, or to use the minimum number of edit operations to achieve the goal. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Is there yeah. like a order? How many orders numbers. of magnitude more uh, queries do it? Or uh, it's still within the same class. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Is there going to be a paper coming out soon? But yeah, uh, yeah a few months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, as far as you're going to understand, the flex operation is on the classes, while the approx uh, operation is on the property path. Yes, the approx is on uh, all of the labels, mm -hmm. and the relax is on the um, actual classes. <coughs> It's also applied to the uh, properties as well if they're expressed in ontology. Flex is applied to both, but that's one I didn't cover. Ah, okay. So, yeah. so uh, when you, uh, let's say, um, so flex operation actually generalizes over classes, let's say. So what does this mean is that you take your class and if you cannot find <coughs> any answer to using, by, uh, using that class, you go to the super class and then up to the super that's class. That's right, yeah, so yeah. So the user can actually stop. If they get good answers immediately, mm -hmm. I wait. Matched exactly, and they're happy with that. Cool. It's just if they carry on saying, "Hey, get me more stuff," then the inferencing starts, and it starts getting deeper and deeper and deeper up to superclass one, superclass of that superclass, and going okay, upwards. Right, yeah. generic, That's right. Yeah. It, yeah. It might be yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. And one of the use cases we're going to do is to see um, which of the operators are actually useful for particular domains, because it yeah. could be in some domains you don't want paths yeah, to actually be deleted from the original. You know, it's like you want that guy to remain there. So, right. yeah. And about the, so the property path instead, so when you, uh, let's say, extend the path of your properties by deletion or insertion and so on, uh, how are you sure that the result would be consistent? So what I mean is that if you take, uh, in this case, you took the next property and then you, let's say, you built on top of the next property, you went on by the next property. But what if you take a different property which leads you to a different kind of data? Is it possible? It is possible, yes. And it's all pretty much everything at the same distance will be returned together. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so yeah. do you yeah. have some kind of uh, criteria for, for avoiding uh, getting uh, inconsistent answers? Uh, you can't really get, in, so that's one of the things I'm proving that the algorithm returns all answers together at the same distance. It doesn't skip out anything and certainly they will only return uh, uh, results that are in the graph that it doesn't okay. kind of... Um, so uh, it's the user's burden to select then what, what makes sense actually? That's, it's the user's burden to configure what they actually want. Right. So if they don't want deletion, as I say, they would say not to. And then, then they can actually apply costs, uh, costs to each um, edit operation separately. So they could uh, say that a deletion operation should be more expensive, therefore results returned by virtue of removing a mm -hmm. path comes much later than something that actually... Um, right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.